Those are creative tab, I accept the TABA agreements. Professor Dershowitz, well, you should explain. Many we're going to focus well. on this next question. Mr. Paris, why are you objecting to We're going to gonna focus on this next question. Uh, hello? You are. Uh, yes. Hi. Uh, my name is Abraham Reisman. I'm a, a, a sophomore at the college. Uh, this is really a question for both of you, but I guess I'll uh, ask Professor Chomsky just because uh, Professor Dershowitz just spoke. Um, it's sort of funny that we're all here, uh, given that a lot of us have never been to Israel, never been to Palestine, and it's long been one of the sort of strange paradoxes in world politics that uh, Americans and people the world over can get so enraged about uh, either side um, when it's a conflict that many of us will never firsthand experience. Um, specifically, how would both of you like to see young people like me and a lot of us here um, envisioning the conflict in the future because a lot of us have a tendency to internalize it to a degree where it's not about people anymore on both sides um, mm -hmm. there are people I know who are okay. ardent Zionists who never go to Israel who believe in it because they're very religiously Jewish and all of a sudden it becomes detached from the realities on the ground and there are people who are very pro-Palestinian who are strongly in favor of social justice and economic justice. Okay, thank I'm you. I'm sorry. Yeah, how do you? Professor Chomsky. Well, I, my feeling is you, sh you should approach it as an American. And for an, as for an American, it is one of the lead issues in the world. Uh, the, you know, Israel is able to do these things, to dismantle and destroy the West Bank, to dis disintegrate the community, because the United States gives it massive aid unparalleled in international affairs, not only military and economic, but also diplomatic by, as I've mentioned, for the last 30 years, unilaterally blocking the two-state settlement, which Israel also totally rejected, uh, alone, the two of them. And as long as you, the American taxpayer, goes on supporting this, yes, it'll continue. And it'll lead uh, to exactly what uh, the Bantustan-style a uh, solution that uh, Ben Venisti and others describe, right on the ground. And yes, so therefore it's an, of enormous importance to Americans. As for solutions, pretty straightforward. Uh, they were coming close to a solution at Taba until Israel called it off. Uh, it, negotiations continued, leading to several proposals, of which the most detailed were the Geneva Accords. You can find out what I thought about all of those in print. You can ask. Mr. Dershowitz, where he supported them in print. Mm -hmm. uh, the Geneva Accords in December 2002 were accepted by essentially the whole world. Israel rejected them. The U.S. refused even to send a message to the Geneva meetings. Uh, but they're still potentially alive, and American citizens can compel our own government to reverse its program, to accept the international consensus for the first time, and then we'll be on the way to a solution. Thank you. Well, I, I, have, <laughs> I, too, have written about the Geneva Accords in, in Chapter 6 of my book, and I generally support uh, many elements of the Geneva Accords. I do not support the right of return. That is, the idea that uh, uh, 700,000 or now 4 million Palestinians can demographically destroy Israel. Which is by, rejected in the Geneva Accords. It is Accords. not rejected in the Geneva it Accords. It is not accepted or rejected. It is left for future negotiation. Exactly. It, it is left is, open because it, well, the, now, Palestinians, now, now, okay. because the Palestinians you change your view. already. First it's okay. accepted, fine. then it's left open. Yeah, What's fine. your next Let's position? Let's be precise. Okay. Okay. They did not say anything about that because now, the now, Palestinians had already now, at Camp David and at Taba accepted the so-called pragmatic settlement, which would not affect the demographic character that of Israel. Is, if you want to learn about that, false. read the serious scholarship like Ron That Lundas, is simply head of the false. Peace I can tell you that totally. President Clinton told me directly and personally that what caused the failure of the Camp David Taba Accords was the refusal of the Palestinians in Arafat to give up the right of return. Okay. That was the sticking point. It wasn't Jerusalem. It wasn't borders. It was the right of return. Okay, now, you if, you believe, if you believe that the United States has unilaterally rejected the two-state solution, that's what we heard from Professor Chomsky, that it's the United States that has rejected the two-state solution, when every modern American president has favored the two-step solution, I say, Welcome to Planet Chomsky. Now, now just we can hold there. Here's a simple exercise. You can believe one of two things. 
the extensive published diplomatic record, which I gave you a sample of, and you can find in detail in books of mine and others, or what Mr. Dershowitz says he heard from somebody. No, or, check. or, and check okay. the diplomatic record. Professor Dershowitz, all. Check the maps. Sir, your question. And, and read Dennis Ross's book, okay. which contains appendices which have okay. the diplomatic record. What Chomsky is telling you to do right. is read the uh, available record in Esperante. He constantly tells you to read sources. He knows you can't read because he knows if you check okay. his sources, they are false. They okay, are simply the you are false. Capable of he sir. makes How it many up you are as he goes of along. English? That's the reality. Okay, thank How you. many of you are capable of reading English? And if he says you, you don't find it in the press, his answer is, it's not in the press. It's part of a conspiracy Let's to go. keep it out of the press. Okay. Thanks very he much. can't it's lose. In it's in the documentary record. Okay. It's in the documentary record, which happens to be quite different you from the press. You can say that. Okay. Not you only on this it, issue. But, you know, you can right. cry wolf so it's many times. It's important, gentlemen. Uh, I think it's important that we take advantage of your expertise your many years of wisdom by hearing a couple more questions. Please, you are. Hi, my name is Tal Silverstein, and I was campaign manager and later on special advisor to Prime Minister Barak in Camp David. So I think I know, uh, at least know less than uh, Ron Pundak, my friend, about what happened in Camp David in Tava, and in Tava. I'm saying it only because I think that what Mr. Professor Chomsky said here, a lot of things are inaccurate, even though... Do you have a question? Yes. Please Even though give it. I think just before the question, because it's very important. Please go directly to your question. The, the, you know, there was a question before that had about a seven-minute pre prerequisite. This is a, this is an expert who was there, who was an eyewitness. I think he should be permitted to precede his question with a one-minute point. I don't. I don't want to go. I don't want to go into history, and I'm a little excited because you have to understand one thing. I believe we have only one last opportunity to reach peace, and this is this coming party and this coming election. Now, my question to you, Professor Chomsky, and I and I agree with you, Israel has done a lot of c crazy and terrible things to Palestinians, and Palestinians have done a lot of crazy and terrible things to Israelis. But let's say that the new party, after the election, guided by Sharon is to offer the Palestinians a deal. It doesn't matter which deal, a deal. That will be accepted by most Palestinians. Would you, you support this deal even if it doesn't reflect your views or your ideological views? Uh, well, I'm glad to see that you, I assume you endorse Ron Pundak's expert, expert knowledge, correct? I therefore recommend to all of you who read English that you read uh, the summary of his review of all of this in the Journal of the Institute for, of Strategic uh, uh, and Security Studies in England. And the, for those of you who read Hebrew, like you, I presume, you read the much longer study that Ron Pundak and Sha uh, Shaul Ariely wrote. It's on the Paris uh, Center website, which describes in detail, if you like, I can quote it from you. As to what I would Ron accept... Ron Pundak was not in Camp David, by the way. Pardon? Ron Pundak was not in Camp he David. He was one of the negotiators in the background. He was not. He was one of the negotiators in the background, and he was, he was, from, he was from Oslo, and his study... He's from Oslo. He was, study, never, he was not his, even close to Camp his David, study, for the record. He was one of the advisors, as you know, Chomsky and his study so in 2000... True. Read his, You're the one who told me you agree, you agree with him. You think, if you think not tell the uh, Shimon Peres Center to fire him as director. Uh, those are the basic Israeli documents. Furthermore, they're supported by plenty of others. If you want to know more about Taba, you can read the uh, uh, European U Union report accepted by both sides, which says exactly what I said. Uh, as to your question, yes, I already told you the answer. There is a very good solution on the table. It's the solution that they came close to in Taba before Israel canceled it, and that was then carried forward by high-level Israeli and Palestinian negotiators informally, leading to the Geneva. That's Quiet, I'm telling please. you. It's leading to the December 2002 Geneva Accords, which are right there. You can read them in English. You can read them in Hebrew. They're 
on the web, uh, no problem, look up the Gush Shalom, Shalom website. That's a pretty good solution. It's I didn't not get perfect. The answer, sorry. That's the answer to your question. No, the yes. answer was even if it I, wasn't I, your plan, and pardon? most Palestinians. Pardon? Even if it wasn't the plan that you think is optimal, or I. Uh, what and are you most asking? Palestinians, because I know most Israelis probably would vote for it. If most Palestinians would vote for it, even if it's not optimal, it's not going to be optimal, let me tell you. If most Palestinians would vote for it, would you accept it as a It's people? not up to me to accept. You asked what I thought. Okay. What I thought is, what I think is a, there's a very simple, creative solution, which happens to be very close to the international consensus that I've been supporting for 30, over 30 years and that the United States and Israel have been unilaterally blocking. It was reached by high-level Israeli and Palestinian negotiators, and though there hasn't been a vote about it, I, my guess is that if there was a poll on both sides, majorities on both sides would probably accept it. But that's totally different from the proposals of, uh, of, of the uh, Sh uh, Sharon Peres party, the Kadima, uh, or incidentally of Peretz's labor party so far. So far he simply endorsed the expansionist program that breaks up the West Bank into cantons. Perfect selective, perfect selective use of Shimon Perez, you know, the Shimon Perez Peace Center. I want to read you a quote from Noam Chomsky. He described Shimon Perez, he described Ronald Reagan at one point as the semi-divine Reagan, as one of the iconic group of mass murderers from Hitler to Idi Amin to Perez. Uh, so on the one day of the week, you find uh, Noam Chomsky describing Perez, this great man of peace, as an iconic mass murderer. And on another day, he's quoting the authority of Shimon Perez to make peace. I mean, me. where do you stand on Shimon Perez? Is he a man of peace or is he an iconic mass murderer? Uh, he is a, an iconic mass murderer, and I've given plenty of evidence for it. And he is not a man of peace. What I, didn't re I did not refer to Shimon Perez. I referred to the director of the Shimon Peres Peace Center. That's so you, not Shimon Peres. But you stick, you stick to the argument that said. Shimon Peres, the man who just joined in to make peace, is an iconic mass murderer you want me and to run not a man of peace. I think that says it all. Okay. You want me to run through his record? And including no, the fact that as late as 1996, he informed the press that a Palestinian state will never happen. And in 1997, he said, Maybe we can ultimately tolerate it somewhere, but we're not saying where. That's not a man of peace. Yes, Thank you. <laughs> you are. My name is Amy Levin. I'm a first year at the Kennedy School. My question is for Professor Dershowitz. You had said that one of the steps in your plan for peace in the future was for the Palestinians to stop their terrorism activities. Right. So my question would be, if you were advising the Israeli government is there anything about their current strategy and how they respond to these terrorism tactics that you would advise them to change to move forward? Yes, I would. Uh, I do not favor, uh, for example, house destructions. Um, on the other hand, I do think that uh, targeted killings of ticking bomb terrorist leaders and terrorists has been quite effective. Um, uh, hundreds, perhaps thousands of terrorist acts have been prevented, um, including an attempt to blow up uh, a gas tank outside of Tel Aviv, including uh, an attempt to blow up a port in Ashdod. Uh, tens of thousands of Israelis probably would have been killed, but for the intelligence activities and the preventive activities of uh, the Israeli government. I have a, a book coming out in January called Preemption, where I set out all the parameters of where I think preemptive acts are justified, where I think they're not justified. I think Israel gets a C plus or a B minus in its compliance with uh, human rights uh, in fighting terrorism, which is higher than any country ever has gotten, comparably facing any external threats. And I challenge, in fact, anybody in this room or Professor Chomsky to name me any other country which has faced comparable threats of terrorism, comparable external threats, which has ever had a Supreme Court and an academy which has been more sensitive uh, to the human rights and civil rights of those who would destroy it. I say C plus, B minus. If I were an Israeli, I would demand much more. I would demand that it get up to the B plus range, but surely a much better standard than the United States has followed in Iraq, surely a much higher standard than Egypt or 
uh, uh, Jordan, surely a much higher standard than France, followed when faced with terrorist threats, and at least comparable and probably better than uh, England uh, when it was facing terrorist threats from uh, Northern Ireland. So when you make comparisons and you argue that Israel is the worst human rights violator in the world, which is the mantra on planet Chomsky, one always has to look at comparable factors in comparable countries. It's not enough to single out Israel and say Israel isn't perfect. If, in fact, you wanted to have divestiture, which Chomsky, before he opposed it, favored it, um, if you uh, wanted to have divestiture, I'd favor it if you listed all the countries in the world in terms of their compliance with human rights and did divestiture in order of their compliance, you would never even get to Israel on that list. Professor Chomsky. Uh, if you would like to, uh, here's, an exercise, here's an exercise for the reader. I won't waste your time on it. Write a letter to Alan Dershowitz. Ask him to cite the source where I described Israel as the worst human rights violator in the world, or even anything remotely like it. If he had ever, if he would ever look at a word that's written, so he would know, for example, that I was supporting the two-state settlement in the early 70s when he was saying nothing about it and hasn't until recently, he would also know that I described in detail how the U.S. the Israeli record was considerably better than the U.S. record. But to answer his challenge. Uh, there are certainly cases that are much better than Israel's record, countries that have suffered far worse terrorism and have not done anything like for, for example, us. I'll start, let's take, two, the two, take an obvious case, Nicaragua. Uncontroversial case, uncontroversial because much as you hate the world court, uh, the world court uh, ruled that the United States was carrying out what it called unlawful use of force against Nicaragua. That's international terrorism in lay language. Uh, the case was run by one of your distinguished colleagues uh, the, uh, and ordered the U.S. to stop the terrorist attacks uh, and to pay massive reparations. The U.S. rejected the court judgment, uh, vetoed two Security Council resolutions supporting the court judgment, went on to practically destroy the country. Uh, the number of people killed in that terrorist attack translating to per capita equivalents here, it would be about 2.25 million. That's more than the total in all U.S. wars ever. There were no targeted assassinations. And unlike Israel, Nicaragua didn't even close newspapers. I mean, Israel has repeatedly closed newspapers, even in Israel, but mostly in the occupied territories, because it claims that they have some connection with terrorists. The leading newspaper in Nicaragua, right to the end, was owned by a supporter of the U.S. terrorist army and was openly on its front pages calling for the overthrow of the government. Occasionally they reduced some of its newsprint. They never closed it. Uh, that's one case, an obvious one. Take an even more obvious case, Cuba. Uh, the United States launched, since we're at the Kennedy Center, I can point out that John F. Kennedy <laughs> launched a major terrorist attack against Cuba in 1961, right after the uh, failure of the Bay of Pigs. It was a very serious terrorist war, plenty of documentation about it from the best sources you can, you like, Arthur Schlesinger, Raymond Gartoff, all of you can read that. Major terrorist war it's going on right to the present, based in Florida. Cuba has not carried out terrorist actions in the United States. So Cuba so, has a better human rights record than Israel no, on, on the, planet on, Chomsky. On the issue but nowhere of, else in the sorry, world. Sorry, on the issue of preemption, which is the one you raised. Uh, yes, you raised a challenge about preemption, and I told you that there are many much better cases. No, I didn't in say fact, that. I, let, I me very clear, let me be I'll very give clear you an what I say right now. Uh, Israel and uh, the, uh, the United States are both threatening Iran. Uh, with destruction. Uh, well, you know, preemption, according to Dershowitz, would require that uh, Iran be carrying out targeted assassinations in Israel and the United States. Right. I That's think outrageous. we need to uh, hold there. We're going to go. This is going to be our last question of the evening up here. Um, my name is Lori Krasulik. I'm a second year MPP student. Thank you for this lively debate. Um, what, uh, I have a question kind of directed at both of you. But Professor Dirkowitz, in your book, you said you hoped to have a win-win situation right. where uh, everyone had to give something up. And what's clear to me um, after this debate and just looking at history that no one's able to come to a resolution 
where they're willing to give up enough to the other person. So it seems to me that the only way to win is to have everybody lose. So I'd like you to comment on a proposal where maybe if you all lost, we'd actually come out winning. Well, I think there is a win-win possible situation. Uh, Israel has been giving up much. Uh, it gave up uh, the, the Gaza. Uh, it, by the way, offered to give up the Gaza to Egypt way back in the early 1980s, Egypt wouldn't take it back. Uh, there was no international outcry over the occupation of the Gaza by Egypt for 20 years, nor was there any international And I'm sure there must be a long record. Check Chomsky's writing. He must have in print large opposition to the occupation of Gaza by Egypt and strong opposition to the occupation of the West Bank by uh, Jordan. Funny, I never came across it in my research, but I'm sure it must be there if you check at least the Czechoslovakian version of one of his writings. Uh, and and uh, so I, I do think there's a win-win solution. The win-win solution is the one I proposed starting in 1967, and that is Israel make territorial adjustments necessary to secure its uh, boundary and securities consistent with Palestinian rights, no occupation of Palestinian cities, um, a two-state uh, solution, uh, that is a win-win situation. And, and let me tell you why I consider myself pro-Palestinian. I am pro-Israel and pro-Palestinian because I favor a viable, healthy, economically strong, politically democratic Palestinian state. That will be good for Palestine, it will be good for Israel, it will be good for the world. Israel has a major stake in the success of Palestine, whereas the Palestinians have never had a major stake in the success of Israel. And so I see a successful Palestinian state, a viable, largely contiguous Palestinian state as a win-win situation, not only for Israel and the Palestinians, but for the United States and the rest of the world. I only hope that Professor Chomsky can join me in agreeing that we're not going to get a perfect solution. And let's just advocate a solution that's acceptable. The question that was asked before was, to me, the key question. If the Palestinians accept the solution that Professor Chomsky finds unacceptable, will he use his enormous resources as the most influential intellectual in the world today to turn the Palestinians against this peace proposal, or will he lend his great prestige to urging the Palestinians and his academic supporters all over the world to accept a pragmatic compromise solution. Professor Chomsky, a lot turns on you. You are a very important and influential person, and therefore you ought to understand your power and use it in the interests of peace. Okay. Just, be <laughs> Just before uh, I ask one of the most uh, influential intellectuals today to respond to uh, Laurie's question, just to tell you where we're headed, Professor Chomsky will respond, then in accordance with our uh, rules of procedure and decorum for this evening, I will ask uh, Professor Chomsky to offer a two-minute summary uh, for the evening to be followed by Professor Dershowitz. Professor Chomsky. Yes. Well, uh, with regard to my opposition to the Jordanian-Egyptian occupation, there is ample material in print, and there has been for 35 years, uh, ever since I publicly and openly and very prominently supported the two-state settlement, which Mr. Dershowitz says he now supports. I'm glad to hear that. I don't know the background evidence. Uh, let's return, and that means, of course, opposing Jordanian Egyptian occupation. Uh, let's turn to the question we were asked to address. Where do we co go from here? Well, we actually have two fundamental choices. One choice is to support Washington's continued dedication to the road to catastrophe that's outlined by Israel's four former security chiefs, uh, namely watching in silence as Washington funds the cantonization of the West Bank, the breaking of its organic links to Jerusalem, and the disintegration of the remnants of Palestinian society. Uh, that choice adopts the advice of uh, Moshe Dayan to his cabinet colleagues in the early 70s. Dayan was in charge of the occupation. Uh, he advised them that we must tell the Palestinians that we have no solution, you shall continue to live like dogs, and whoever wishes may leave. 
That's the solution that is now being implemented. Don't take my word for it. Go check the sources I cited. Very easy, all English. There's an alternative. The alternative to, is to return to the spirit of the one break in U.S.-Israeli rejectionism. That is, the week in Taba in January 2001, before Israel called it off, and to take seriously the follow-up proposals from high-level negotiators on both sides, of which the Geneva Accords are the most detailed. There is overwhelming international support for taking them as the basis for a political settlement. It does come close to the long-standing international consensus that the United States and Israel have barred and that I've personally been supporting for the last over 30 years. That's the road away from catastrophe towards an end to violence and towards eventual reconciliation. Either choice is within our reach. From that point on, it's up to us. Thank you. Professor Dershowitz. We do seem to have a remarkable point of agreement. I think we both do agree that the proposals made at Taba do provide a useful basis for a peace process. Now, Taba didn't end because Israel left. Taba ended because Arafat rejected Camp David, thereby causing the election of Sharon over Barak. There was no government, essentially, that could carry out the Taba proposals, which were favored by a very, very large number of Israelis. Uh, that's why uh, Prince Bandar said to Arafat at Camp David and at Taba, if you reject the proposals at Camp David, you're going to get Sharon instead of Barak. You're never, ever going to get a better deal. Thankfully, he was wrong. Sharon emerged as a man of courage and a man of vision. And I myself, although I never did support Sharon in the past, strongly support the efforts made by Sharon and Perez, a great, great man of peace, a man who has vision, a man who imagines the future, a man who can bring about peace in the world and peace in the Middle East. And I think the prospects for a peace based on the Taba proposals are quite realistic. I think that if this party wins the election and invites the Palestinians to the table and the Palestinians don't again miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity, there will be a real prospect for negotiation, a real prospect for a peace based on pragmatism. One final word about the sources, please. The other area where Professor Chomsky and I agree, check his sources. <laughs> Take him at his word. Go back tonight and Google and read the sources. Read them in English, read them in whatever language you can, and then email us both as to what the sources show. And finally, in a constructive and positive way, I urge you, imagine peace. Imagine the peace dividend that will come to the world if finally a pragmatic solution based on peace comes to the Palestinian people and the Israeli people. I'm hoping for shalom, for salam, and for peace. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Just before we uh, conclude, and I uh, thank our speakers, I want to share with you in a very few seconds what I have heard tonight standing between uh, these two scholars. The first... The first is that in looking around this room, it is clear to me that being members of the international community to which we all belong, whether we have been to Israel or Palestine or to other conflict arenas or not, that people can care deeply about people in conflict and understand that there needs to be a way through. Secondly, as we heard from some of our questioners, the parties themselves, Israelis and Palestinians, seem to be post-disengagement and in their two election processes, quickly approaching a crossroads, perhaps a tipping point where 
some form of acceptable solution that will involve some part of loss of the dream to both sides will make pragmatism reign. The third thing in which I've been honored to be a part of this discussion tonight is that academe and the scholarly community matter in this discussion. I have read a great deal of the works of both Professors Chomsky and Dershowitz, and in both of these readings, whether you agree with points of view, challenge their sources, is beside the point. What you have been treated to tonight is two individuals who have spent a lifetime thinking very, very hard about some of the most difficult problems in international public policy, and on behalf of this group here tonight, to my scholarly colleagues, I am eternally grateful. Thank you for coming.